Okay, we are recording. So I am Dr. Kim Godwin. I'm an instructional designer with MTSU Online. And with me today are Tara Perrin and Dr. Karen Hine. And they are also instructional designers for MTSU Online. And they will be monitoring the chat today. So if y'all have questions or things that you want some clarification or a sale past something and you want more information on it, uh, pop in there. They are so great at answering those and also getting my attention. Uh, because sometimes I keep going and y'all need me to slow it down and reel it back. So make sure if you need anything that y'all pop in there because they are awesome at monitoring the chat. Uh, and before we get going, I also wanted to point out that there are several uh, presentations and some pretty cool events coming up through the LTN ITC. So make sure you're watching your email or checking the workshop schedule for some of the things that are coming up that you might be interested in. Today, we are going to be talking about infographics for assessment and the benefits of those for both students and faculty. So I'm going to, takes me just a little bit with technology to get my screen share happening, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and do some screen sharing with you. And we have not shared the resources as of yet for this presentation, but we will after everything is said and done, so you will get links to resources, uh, the PowerPoint, any of the information that we share, we will get those to you all after the presentation is over. Um, there's a little bit I'll have to do to get some of them to you because I'm linking you to actual D2L classes that you all don't have access to. So I'll need to do some exports and things like that to make sure that you get all the resources that you need after the fact, uh, and I usually wait just to make sure if there's something else that you all want during the presentation that I can add that to that information so you get everything in one. So I'm gonna go ahead and do some screen sharing. And y'all are gonna get my whole screen and then you're gonna get a bunch of other stuff that changes, okay. So here we are, um, MTSU Online. We're going to talk a little bit about infographics and assessments today. Uh, and again, the benefits to faculty and students. And I want to clarify that I talk about it in terms of faculty and students because we're going to talk about it from a couple different perspectives today and how infographics really can help you as faculty, especially in terms of grading and meeting the needs of your students, and then some of the additional benefits to students in the long term, not just in your course or other courses that they're in this semester, but overall, some of those benefits to them. So here are our outcomes for this presentation today. We're going to describe the purpose of an infograph, and we're going to look specifically as well at lots and hots, as well as upscaling. And we're going to explore the common types of infographics. I'm going to identify the three components that make for a great infographic. Uh, recognize good and bad examples of infographics. I'm sure if any of you have ever seen an infographic, you have seen both good and bad. So we're going to look a little bit at those and, and how we can help encourage our students to create some pretty high quality infographics. And then feel confident assigning infographics in one of your courses and within that also sharing some uh, assignment instructions that y'all are welcome to have and then update as well as some D2L rubrics and rubrics outside of D2L that you might be able to use and update for your course specifically. So what is an infographic? Uh, Vingage tells us that an infographic is just a collection of images and uh, information to create a more visual, visually appealing uh, activity, assignment, process of information, uh, however it is that you're going to get that information to your students and or from your students. So really thinking about it in terms of how are they going to be conveying the information to you in terms of the activities and assessments in your classes and doing that in a, a visual way that creates that opportunity for them to show their learning. Uh, and it, again, I know I mentioned that I would send you all some resources, but Vingage is one of the uh, premier free resources out there for the creation of infographics. So I wanted to add that link here so that y'all had one of the ways to get to it and could kind of go back if you are thinking about using these in your classes. It's a really great explanation from them about what these are. Um, and then there's also some information from way back a thousand years ago. So 
about two, two and a half years ago, in the early pandemic, when we were uh, updating that MTSU stay on course page, that we created some infographic information for y'all. And you can actually still get there. That page is still live. So there are some resources there where we also talk about uh, infographics and how those create some opportunities for you and for your students. I think the biggest thing to know about what is an infographic is that it really is just a visual representation of what it is that you have been discussing in the course or what students have been reading and researching and developing in the courses. Uh, it kind of creates that opportunity to use different types of learning skills and um, how they can take information and analyze and synthesize it and then create something which really promotes their overall memory and learning of what it is that you're talking about. Uh, and that really leads into the lots and hots. So lots and hots are part of Bloom's taxonomy uh, and his new tax taxonomy, his revised one. Uh, I'm really more of a think kind of a person, but I really greatly appreciate that that Bloom's has it in the six levels so that we can look at it in terms of lower order thinking and higher order thinking. And that's what lots and hots are. So lower, low, high words, nice to meet you. Lower order thinking skills for Bloom's are things like remembering, understanding and applying. And then the higher ones are the analyze, evaluate and create. And so when we're thinking about those in our classes, it at the beginning of the semester or maybe in a, a lower level introductory course, we're going to focus a lot more on those lower order thinkings because it's about them, the student remembering things and applying that information. And, and that's where you use things like describe, identify, things like that are going to be the verbs that we're looking at to really help our students gather the information from the class. When we're looking into those higher orders of analyze and evaluate and create, the remembering, understanding, and applying are understood. You have to have some remembering, some understanding, and some applying to be able to analyze, evaluate, and create. So when we're thinking about our outcomes or we're thinking about how we're going about creating an infograph, it's understood that they know how to describe. How are they using that description to analyze, paraphrase, synthesize information, and then create something else that's taking their knowledge and taking it to the next level? Uh, so infographics are one of those really awesome ways that we can assess what our students are learning uh, at a much higher level. And for so many of us, Doing something helps us remember it better uh, and taking information and breaking it down and taking the information to build something new also emphasizes our own creativity and our own ability to show who we are and make the activity much more active and authentic in its process. Uh, so that's just a couple of things to think about with infographics. So there are seven common types of infographics. There's the list. That's pretty given. It's just a list. Comparison, so like a side-by-side -side of this versus this. Um, flow chart, just a flow of information. Kind of think like a maybe a concept map or uh, just how information is flowing from this to this to this to this. And I'll show you all some um, examples here in just a little bit. Visual article, a map, a timeline. Uh, you know, these are great. Timelines are great for uh, history activities, uh, or if we're talking about the, the flow of um, how different types of periods happen within literature, um, you know, and looking at these two, these are some really great ways to represent parts of an essay or parts of a story or types of poems or different things like that that we're thinking about having um, a student create an infograph that talks about the different components of a play is maybe a little more interesting to them and to you for reading um, down the road if it's in an infograph instead of an essay. Uh, and then also data visualization. So when we're kind of looking at um, the information for um, for how things are, are going into a different 
project or presentation and what that looks like uh, for our students. Okay, so let's look at the three C's. Um, I call them the three C's of, of infographic development and it's clear imagery. And one of these is, this is one of the ones that I start with the most because I think when you're, you're looking at an infograph, it's really super helpful to have clear information and your imagery not be so much that you're taking away from the wording and the content of the presentation. So one of those resources that um, I have shared with you is the Flaticon. So Flaticon is a list of free digital imagery that's out there uh, on the internet for you to use, which is where you find graphics. So, you know, all those flat graphics that you see on things. Um, this is one of those places that you can find them and you can search for almost anything. So, um, you know, if we wanted to find a graphic of a, um, let's see, um, a horse. Um, so we'll just, and that will pop up as it thinks about it. It will pop up images of a horse. So if we are talking about our upcoming homecoming celebration and that it's centered on the derby, maybe we need some horse images. And this is a great place to go and get some free images that are flat images and not too busy for an infograph. So that is one of the places you can go. There's others out there, but this is the one I tend to use the most because there's just so many and they are freely available. Um, I, another um, item to think about is color choice. And by that, I don't mean necessarily like pick your favorite color or anything like that. It's it's also about color contrast and making sure that it's visually appealing. So when we're looking at uh, an infograph, if everything on the infograph is blue, various shades of blue, while blue might be pretty and MTSU might like blue, it is really hard to read the information if every single thing on it is a various shade of blue. So you really want to think about your contrast between, do we have some blues? Do we have some reds? Do we have whites and blacks? And, and contrast enough that people are drawn to it and can read it without having to really stop and really, really, really focus. You know, as you're walking down a hallway and you see something and it's just a whole bunch of blue, it's going to turn you off a little bit because you know you have to really, really focus on it. If it has... Uh, clear imagery that are specific to the words that are being said, if it has eye popping colors, it's going to bring you into it, make you want to stop and look at it. Uh, and that goes with visually appealing too, is really think about your colors and how those colors uh, go with each other. Some colors don't always go so well together. Uh, they don't They don't necessarily look nice next to each other. So maybe not yellow and neon green and hot pink um, unless we're going for like an 80s vibe but kind of avoid some of the colors that clash each other when they're next to each other because that also makes it harder for us to read when we see them and then the third C is concise wording or information and that's when we really synthesize the information and bring it down to only having a few words to depict what it is that we're talking about. So, you know, I said, do as I say, not as I do. This slide is not so bad. It's only got a few words here and there. But if this was an infograph, it really would just have the three C's across the top. And then it would say imagery and then talk one sentence about imagery. Color choice, one sentence about color choice. Concise wording, one sentence about um, color, about concise wording uh, and how we might take a look at some of those things and and limit them down so it's not too terribly much information because again you're going to catch these as you're walking down a hall or as an advertisement that someone gives you or as something that you're using uh, as a an ad that people are creating for a marketing or business class really looking at how we're using that and not putting too much words in it. Because if we're thinking about how students are synthesizing that information and taking it from a, an entire module of resources or a chapter in a textbook or an hour long movie or whatever it is that's the, the resource that they're, they're looking at to create this, how are we taking 
25 pages of information and then scaling that down to a one page image based document. Uh, how are we making that happen? So um, I got to another uh, little image to look at. This is actually um, from when uh, Tara's presentation this summer at uh, D2L's National Conference Fusion. Um, this was the infograph from the, the introduction short uh, live virtual presentation. And so I just wanted to show you what an, this infograph might look like. Um, Are y'all able to see that okay? Okay. Uh, so this is what an infographic might look like. It's concise, it's bright. Um, the information kind of pops off the page. Uh, if you want to, you could actually QR code that right there and it will give you a little bit more information about H5P, um, but you don't don't have to, it's fine. Uh, you can always reach out to Tara later. She'll tell you all kinds of stuff and she's got a presentation coming up in three weeks too. So as you can look at this infographic, I wanted to share it because it, it has all three of those C's in there. It has clear imagery. We've got a money thing because this actually talks about it being worth the investment. We have the little people icon. We have a little check mark. We have some results in a graph. So it's showing you that there's just one little icon, one little thing that depicts the information on there. Each of those little boxes is in a bright enough color that it kind of pops off the page you are drawn to look at what those are. This is a little flow chart of how the presentation is gonna go. And then it's very limited in its information per box so that it's, it's big enough font that you can read it. You have an idea of what's going on in each of those things. And it kind of brings you in to get a little bit more information about what it is that's gonna be talked about in each of those. So it keeps it concise without you know what we're going to say, you know what we're going to cover, uh, but it's not just paragraphs and pages of information. All right, so any of y'all that came to my five for fall know that I actually turned it into seven for fall because I apparently can't count and numbers are beyond me. So there's actually a couple more that I typically add. I don't think they're necessarily the the three most important, uh, but they're definitely important for the creation of an infograph and how you would go about doing that uh, and talking to your students about it and how you might go about creating one to share with your students about information or as an example. So copyright. I said earlier there's some free imagery out there. There are images that you can get from just about everywhere from free, but that doesn't mean that they're actually free. Uh, so this is my spiel of please make sure that you are actually using images that are free either through the Creative Commons, uh, which is the, the CC logos that you've probably started seeing on some things. Uh, Creative Commons is what allows people to freely share resources through open educational resources and through um, different websites and uh, like the Flaticon and and there's a whole bunch of them out there. Uh, so you're going to want to look for ones that say they are freely shared, that they are openly available, looking for that little CC code at the bottom. Uh, same with Wikimedia or Wikicommons. You're probably going to be able to find a lot of imagery through using the the wiki sources because those are are free and fall typically under public domain or have at least gotten the cc attached to them so that you can use them uh, if you just do a google search or a DuckDuckGo or bing or whatever you use um, and you click on the images tab you're going to get a whole lot of images that show up but as you go over them and you you mouse over them you will see that some of them say that they have copyright restrictions or they say for purchase or fees may apply or things like that, any of those are not freely available and you cannot use those unless you pay for them. So just think about that when you're picking your images or when you're talking to your student about imagery that free needs to actually be 
freely shared and available through copyright restrictions. Um, Winnie the Pooh is now available, so we can all now use Winnie the Pooh, but it's the original Winnie the Pooh, not the Disney Winnie the Pooh. So kind of think about those things as we're thinking about copyright. And then my other piece of advice on this, and it's not a C, which is part of why I can't put it in there, but use a template. Um, there are a million templates out there for infographics. You do not have to um, start from scratch and and be the most artistically creative individual on the planet. There are a ton of templates out there that you can look through and pick the one that you're like, oh, I like this one. It makes me happy. And then you can then edit it as you need to for your own purposes and your own activities. Does anybody have any questions about the three C's before I move on? Okay, why the three C's matter. So remember when I said something about color? Uh, if you look up here at the red one that is predominantly red, um, even when that one is expanded, you can barely read it because it's red with some orangish reds in there as the text. Um, it, it's very hard to read, even when it's expanded and a really crisp, clear image, because the colors are too close together. They don't make you want to read it because you're like, that's going to be some work. And I don't think my glasses are good enough for that. So you just go right past that one. Uh, there's a lot of ways that they could have done this so that it was brighter and easier for the reader to see it. Um, <clears throat> this one that has all these. I don't need all those boxes in terms of a flowchart or concept map or whatever that is. There's imagery all over that. It's got lots of lines everywhere. It's kind of hard to see and figure out what's going where and what's going on with it. There's just too much. There's too many little boxes and it's hard for us to read. We're not going to focus in on that and figure out how we're going to take that and learn from that and evaluate somebody's information. It's too much. Nobody made that concise. Um, sure, some of them have short words in them, but there's a million of them. And then um, the other one that's on there um, is one that in terms of the concise and the imagery and the information, there's just too many words. You don't even know where to start. You don't even know where to look. So there's nothing concise about that because there's just information everywhere. So those are some information some bad examples of infographics and they're out there everywhere if you just google bad examples you'll see a million of them um so those were just some that i picked because they were so bad that it provided you a, a better look of what bad might look like and then these are better um or at least i think these are better so these are some pretty clear information on how things are are available and how you might be more drawn to these because the the colors that have been chosen are um, eye catching. They pop enough. They're you can easily see them from a distance or up close. You're not having to adjust things on your screen if it's digital. You can see these. You're drawn to these. The images on these are depicting what it is that's in the infographic because there's some out there that people will just choose the images because the images are cool but they don't actually represent what it is that you're talking about uh, so looking at these and these three that I have chosen they are much better examples of the color choice the concise and the clear imagery uh, because they really do depict what it is that we're talking about within these and those are all from, just so we're aware, those are all ones that are available as templates in different resources. So now we're going to talk a little bit about assigning and grading, which I think is probably what y'all are here for. You're like, great, Kim, thanks. I've seen an infographic. Can we talk about the part that matters? Sure. Um, so we're here to talk about assigning and grading and what those infographics look like for you and for your students uh, in terms of how are they taking this information and moving it forward? So the number one thing that I, I want to look at with this outside of what we've already talked about, about student learning and engagement and connection to resources and them being able to take a lot of information and scale it down and focus it and 
develop a resource that accentuates their creativity, allows them to be active learners, allows them to show you that they're learning. You are able to measure what they're learning in an infographic just as you would in, say, a paper or a presentation, and maybe even better because they're having to show you their paraphrasing and how they were able to take that information and really make it condensed and describe it to you as if you are an outsider that didn't know anything about it without it being a 10-page paper or a 20-minute presentation, either live or recorded, with PowerPoint slides that you have to go through. So I want you to just for a second think about how long it took you the last time you graded a 10-page paper. Just for a second, think about that, or a 20-minute presentation. How long did it actually take you to read those and grade those and focus on whether or not the students were meeting the outcomes and showing you that they have an understanding of the topics that were being covered. Now I want you to think about how long it might take you to look at an infograph and determine whether or not the student is getting the basic concepts and tying the information together. So thinking about your time, a 20 minute presentation at minimum is going to take you 20 minutes. And then you're also going to have to review their PowerPoint slides and you're going to need to make comments on their presentation, make comments on their slides, uh, really help them add additional information and do some extra, even in a rubric, do some extra feedback based on the presentation, based on the slides. If it's an infographic, it's going to take you two to five minutes, maybe to look at an infographic and assess the same things. You get to quickly pop at it. You see what's on there, see what the student is saying. Are they making the connections that you needed them to make? Are they engaging in the resource? Is that happening? And then there's that extra little benefit of the student is also upskilling. They're learning how to do something that they're so much more likely to use out in the world in their job. Um, I We were talking earlier, the instructional designers were talking earlier, and not often in my instructional designer position do I write a paper. It's not a common occurrence for me. As a faculty member, I write a few more, but as an instructional designer, I don't write a lot of papers, but we actually create a lot of infographics. Uh, we do that on the regular. Uh, so this is something that if as an institution, as a, a mission and vision for our institution that we're preparing our students for the workforce, we're preparing them to be engaged employees when they leave, are we providing them with that skill set that's helping them go to that next level when they go to their job and someone asks them to create an infographic, have we given them an opportunity in a safe environment of our classroom learning to practice and learn how to use a resource that they're likely to use out in the non-academic world? So that's just something to think about with that is it's faster for you. It's also kind of fun to look at because you get to see their creativity and all of the different colors and all of the different layouts and all the different templates that they end up using because they get to put so much active choice into their learning and their creation of an infographic and you get to see that uh, and you get to see them really taking that information and showing you their learning and showing you their understanding in a way that's just fun to look at. Um, I'm, I don't know, maybe y'all really love papers and presentations. I do also love a good paper and presentation, uh, but it's, it's just a different way for them to show you their understanding. So I wanted to show you a couple of examples from um, some of my classes, and these are some of the ones that I said I, I will download some of the information for y'all and share it because they're in actual active classes, um, so I can't give you all the information. Um, so, and clearly I talk a lot about theory. Um, I didn't really realize that till right now, but apparently I talk about theory a lot. Uh, so here are some learning theory infographic instructions. And these are the actual instructions in my class um, to the students. Um, so in this one, I asked them, they actually have to pick a, a learning theory from a, a sheet that I provide them. Um, but I asked them to create an infographic that they explain 
uh, one of those learning theories to me and to their classmates. They actually end up sharing this with their classmates later. Um, but in the beginning, I'm the only one that sees it so that we can kind of go through if they've if they've taken a left turn and it's not exactly on the mark, um, that we can kind of help guide the a better way of developing uh, an infographic and how we might get them there. Um, because sometimes if they've never done one before, even though there's some instructions and examples, sometimes they will go, go to the, well, I don't know how to do that. So I'm just gonna create a PowerPoint. Well, a six or seven slide PowerPoint presentation is not an infograph. That's not a condensing of words. That's, you can make it as long as you want to get everything in there that you think needs to be said, but typically in those cases, there's a lot of quoting of authors. Uh, there's a whole lot more information than is really needed to explain how um, a different theory applies or, or what it looks like. So part of this activity is to get them to take all of that information that's out there and then condense it down so that someone who had not studied it would have a, a baseline understanding of what it was we were talking about. So in this one, I actually use Blooms as an example, and that's partially because I, it means that they can't use it. Um, so I use Blooms in this one, and I tell them about how I would go about developing an infographic and the basic information that I would share. So I would share the pyramid and the six levels. I would personally talk a little bit about the lots and the hots. Um, and then I might even link in a copy of um, the revised verbs so that somebody would have that. I then provide my students with um, different places that they can go to create their infographic, whether that be Canva, um or whatever and you can create one in powerpoint it's just harder uh, i don't know that i encourage it as the the number one way to go but um for a lot of students seeing powerpoint makes them feel comfortable but it also creates an opportunity for additional learning and then i provide examples of infographs and that sends them out and gives them a chance to see some of the ones that are out there and what is available so they're not flying blind into this process. Um, hey, I Dr. want Godwin. them to feel comfortable. Yeah. Can you can you zoom in your screen a little bit? Oh, yeah. Make it larger. I, I always forget that. I'm sorry. There you go. Now y'all can you. read it. Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's what I talk about on this one. Uh, th those are the instructions that I give them. And then I also typically for my announcements in the week that we talk about this in the class, uh, I will give them a little bit more information and provide them a little bit more resources, um, either in video or in just a text post, uh, just so that they feel a little bit more comfortable about it and have, have that confidence to go out and create it because so many of them have never created one. Some of the feedback that I get from that is that they'd never done one before. They were completely freaked out when they went to do it the first time. But once they've created the first one, they then see themselves using them almost immediately in their work environment, which is sort of awesome um, that there's something that they're using and then they get to use it in their real world right away. Uh, and one thing to note, and I'll give you all some of the uh, links to some of these other infographic uh, companies is MTSU uh, does not have a contract with any of these companies. So be very aware with your requirements in terms of security. We cannot require students to use a certain one because they have to make the choices in terms of which ones they're going to go to. Um, free, a lot of them are free, most of them are free, uh, but they also, if they sign up for a free account, need to be aware of their own security choices and we can't require other, other students um, to make security decisions uh, for an external resource. So I know that's not as fun as some of the other topics, but that's why it is that it's not go to Canva and use this. All right, um, and then I wanted to show you the rubric that I actually use in this class to grade that Dropbox.
and I will share this with you. I will export it so that y'all can have it. Um, so this is my learning theories infographic uh, rubric, and it's a D2L rubric. This is a 50-point activity, and this is my rubric. So remember a minute ago when we were talking about how long does it take you to grade a 10-page paper or a 20-minute presentation with slides? If you're looking at your rubrics and you're thinking about your rubrics with your papers or your presentations or those types of projects, um, and you're thinking about how many things you have to grade and all the things that you really have to focus on, this one is a little bit different because what you're looking at is did they follow the requirements? Like, did you meet the requirements if you covered this information about the learning theory and you present it in a condensed manner without excessive text. Um, to me, that's the most important part of this is that they took the information and they condensed it down in a way that it's not a huge project, that you've taken that and you have on your own really analyzed and evaluated the information and created something to paraphrase all the information that's out there. And then I also give them points for creativity, so colors and images and contrast and things like that. Now, on that, I'm not asking for everybody to be an artist. I mean, did they think about their color contrast? Did you use imagery that depicted what it was that you were talking about? Does everything in it have meaning and purpose? So the, the grading of it is a little bit faster for me uh, than it would be for some other things. And the students really do benefit from, okay, here's all this information and now I've synthesized it. And now they know, they know this stuff because they had to know what they were talking about to take pages and pages of information and condense it down into a couple of paragraphs. And then I was gonna show you another one. Um, this is organizational theory instructions. So these are slightly different, um, similar because I use kind of same things. Um, this one is in a discussion. Uh, so they are asked to pick a perspective and there's actually all the threads are below um, and asked to, to pick a, a variance. Um, and this one is, is really so organizational theories, there's so many of them out there. And it is a little bit overwhelming for us to, um, really read and learn and understand all of them. So by having them each go out and pick one that they really study and then present it, you get this extra added bonus of uh, students are becoming very aware of their own. They really go in and they look at and they research and they study and they create in their own, the one that they picked. But by sharing an infograph, or in this one, I, I let students do a lot of choice. I really believe in the autonomy of their activities and assessments. So they could choose an infograph, a podcast, a video, a brief paper, really anything works for them. But when they, they are able to take the information and really condense it down, they are learning. And then when they're sharing it out with their classmates, their classmates are also learning a little bit, enough, enough to know what that one is about without feeling like they have to be experts. Um, so it's really giving the, an opportunity for all of us to get an overview and for some of us to get a very in-depth understanding of what it is these different ideas are talking about. So it creates a, a level of knowing instead of everybody having to read an entire textbook on organizational theory, we're reading individual chapters or sections and then sharing that so that everyone else has kind of a, a basic understanding and knowledge. Uh, and then one of my students uh, created um, uh, this and granted me permission to share it. So I wanted to show you all um, her organizational theory, uh, the spiritual organizational theory infographic. So um, can y'all see that? Okay, I think it should be big enough for you. Um, so it really takes you through the, the concepts of what is the organizational theory that's the spiritual uh, and what that looks like and then she used some some pretty good contrast and color um, there's imagery but there's not too much imagery it's not overwhelming there's not too many words on any one section so if you didn't have a background in understanding of this organizational theory you would be able to read through this and get a gist of what it is that it's about 
and know how to talk about it, but you, you didn't have to spend hours and hours and hours trying to make it all make sense. So you were able to read this and be like, oh, I get it. That's what this one's about. This one is about these main concepts. And I now feel confident if I see someone else talking about this one, I know what they're talking about because I have a general understanding and knowledge because of this infographic. Okay. How do you make them? So here is where all of these um, different resources are available. There are more than this. These are just some of the ones that are most common. Uh, and then I also wanted to make sure when I share this with you, uh, the library is in the process of creating a LibGuide as well. So that will be in there. But I wanted to show you a couple of them. So Canva, you can create a free account with Canva um, up here in the sign up. And this is infographic templates. So earlier when I mentioned that there are a gazillion templates out there, these are your infographic templates. So depending on what it is that you're going to talk about, you can come on here and pick the one that you're like, oh, I like that one. That one makes me feel good. And then you click on it and it opens up. Be aware that with Canva and with any of them, that some templates, some images, some color schemes, some things like that are not free. So just make sure your students know to use the free resources and not to pay for things, that there are enough resources, resources out there that they don't have to pay to get some pretty cool stuff in their infographics. Um, so there are tons, tons, tons of examples of templates out there. I would actually discourage this one that says how to improve your leadership skills, the second one here, because everything is in yellow um, and some of the imaging is sort of, it's too close in color. It helps that they use dark wording, uh, but depending on the individual, that may be hard to see uh, because one of the things to think about with infographics uh, is accessibility and accessibility needs. So be certain that when you are creating a resource uh, or create an assignment like this, that you are aware that if you have a student that has visual impairments, that you have an alternative uh, activity or, or um, assignment that they can do because creating an infographic may be a challenge for them. And then thinking about that in terms of if someone is colorblind or if someone um, needs assistance with viewing images, thinking about what those color schemes look like and creating them in an accessibility format. Um, it takes a little bit. It's easier with some than others. Canva is not the best with accessibility. Some of the other ones are better with accessibility, but going in and adding your alt text and making things accessible, um, you also get to have those conversations about diversity perspective as well when you are creating infographs because of that. Um, I was going to show you some more because uh, there's just not a limit at all to how many are out there. Hey, Dr. Godwin, as you're yes. doing this, have you found a pattern in the students who have submitted these that they prefer one platform or, over another or have you? Um, Someone so, asked. Oh, no, I think that that is actually a fantastic question. So, no, um, I have not found that they prefer one over the other. The students determine the one that they prefer over the others based on their own comfort or ones they may have used before or um, ease of use to them. Um, so I think that's where it's really important to share several. Um, you know, I usually list like three, two or three, and then I say, or others that you find or feel comfortable using because everybody has different levels of comfort and what they want to go out and create. Um, the Vengage and Canva are the ones that I've seen used the most uh, in my classes, but I have seen just about every resource out there used. Uh, and a lot of it does come back to um, student's choice when they log in, they'll click on a bunch of them and they log in. And if they feel overwhelmed by the welcome page, they tend to leave that one and go to another one. So it's about which one speaks to them. And that does also in that give them that extra level of choice in terms of how are you going about creating this and which one are you creating? Um, I have had it 
a few times that within one class, I've had the same template be used three or four times, which is actually really interesting because there's so many out there that amongst 15 people in a class that the same template's used three or four times, but they all look so different because it's the student's creativity that goes into it and the imaging they use or the wording they use that even though there was the same template, they are so diverse in how they convey the information that it really kind of adds some excitement to grading as well. Thank you. I was also Absolutely. going to ask Scott, too, if he knew if there is an MS app that students have free access to that is like an infographic kind of app. It's probably something I should have looked at earlier, but I know we've got all kinds of apps that they have free access to. Do you know if any of those are kind of for this purpose or no? You don't know because I don't know. Way to warn him, huh? <laughs> I know. Sorry, Scott. <laughs> I just happened I to no think of it. I have no okay. clue, but I can look. Thanks, okay. Scott. <laughs> I figured they're just, they're coming out with so many apps under the MS umbrella. This might be one of the ones that they think about might since it is used at work, but but who knows? Okay, sorry. No, you're okay. Um, And then, so that is the end of our slideshow. Um, so uh, I wanted to open it up for questions, information, and other things that I can share with you. We still have... um eight or nine minutes to go before the end. And then as always, we will stay late if anybody has any questions. But uh, does anybody have any questions before I stop the recording or would y'all like for me to stop and then you can ask your questions? Did I there cover everything question. in the chat? Okay. Yeah, there was one last question about um, if you've had, what kind of feedback you've had from students, student reactions to doing infographics? Sure. Um, so, once they do one, they love them. Um, at least that's the feedback that I've gotten. Uh, there's some some stress and concern uh, with that first one if they've never done one before because it's a because they're having to upskill. Uh, and so it's a not only are you are you doing this thing where you're taking the information from whatever resource or whatever activity you're you're trying to learn and do but you're also having to learn how to do an infograph so there's a little bit of nerves um, and anxiety if somebody's never done one but once they've done the first one uh, at least with my students they really do enjoy them and then I see them creating them in other ways or I see them uh, using them in their work environment and I've gotten messages from them that say things like I've never used these before but I've now done them three or four times in the last semester or um, even after the fact getting a message that says uh, this was so great I, I never used one before I'd seen them i thought it was something I couldn't do. Now I know how to do that and I get to do them in my work or in my private life or you know, through organizations that I'm affiliated with and I'm able to, to do things that are a little bit different. Um, a follow-up question, what types of assignments do you think worked best for infographic submissions? And then also Elise has her hand raised. Sure. Um, so let me answer that question first, and then Elise, I'll um, answer your question uh, or ask your question. Um, sure. So to me, anything, which I know is a horrible, horrible response, um, but I think just about anything can actually work as an infographic. Uh, you're going to need to look at, at what the expectations for your own assignments are to determine that. Uh, but for me, I have seen timelines. Um, I think they work fantastic if you have like a flow of information, uh, you know, like it showed you the the ocean one was one of them. But if you're, you know, if you are creating an activity for a science class and you're talking about uh, chemicals or the water cycle or anything like that, being able to do those as images and instead of just words, kind of creates that opportunity for students to, to make it make more sense to them. Um, I've seen it for uh, creation of ads for uh, business and marketing. Um, I've seen it for, I'm, I mean, I can't think of anything that I haven't seen it for, actually. Uh, so, I mean, I've seen it for a lot of things. Um, does anybody have any things that they are curious about whether or not we could be creative for a few minutes and come together with whether or not that might work for an infograph. Um, I'll let y'all think about that while we see Elise's question. Elise, where you, you are on my screen, you're gone now. Uh, 
I love yes. I'm here. Hi. I'm sorry. I'm still using my iPhone, so you can't see me. I apologize. It's okay. Um, so following up on Andrea's question and your comment, I can think of a lot of assignments where this wouldn't work. Sure. And maybe that is about my discipline. Okay. So um, I do literary and film studies and things like that. And so issues of reflection are really important for me. And I'm not sure, I, I feel like an infographic is most useful, as you said, basic concepts and tying them together. So they're great for synthesis. So if I have a, what I would consider a boring assignment, prove to me you have read this chapter of the textbook by making an outline of it, I can see an infographic being a nice substitution for doing an outline and finding ways to make it more interesting than writing an outline ever is. <laughs> um, so if that helps Andrea, yeah, so boring assignments. <laughs> um, I find it less useful as I'm just thinking about it right now for the kind of stuff I do, which is I want close work with texts. And so if I'm doing an infographic, it could be, what are the three most important quotations by the author that you would recommend to others and why and how do they relate to each other. So then you can get those things with arrows going towards each other or a flow. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I focus a lot on reflection, on argument and on close work with texts. And I'm thinking what these would mostly be useful for. So say I've designed a new online class on, on film noir and Karen Hine helped me create a few more creative assignments and approaches. Uh, and I also attended the Holocaust Studies Conference and co-chaired the dang thing. I'm so tired still. <laughs> um, but uh, someone spoke there about an assignment that involved having people read excerpts and you decide is the person that you're, and then you have the other students, instead of reading them, listen to the other students, read them, and then decide whether they're dealing with perpetrators, victims, or bystanders. What do they know about their circumstances and stuff like that? And I'm not sure I would do that as an infographic, although I think you could. But you the could. main thing I'm thinking might work is they read this chapter on film noir and its origins. So what are the primary origins and what are the relationship between those origins and how do they lead to film noir? There you've got a clear direction with an arrow that can point them. So any of those kinds of lists where you put things hanging off of a timeline or that kind of thing I think would work. So I am thinking it is best for objective, what we would call objective work rather than subjective. But I'd love to know if you can think of, anybody can think of specifics more subjective ways to use it. So in classes where I'm looking for reflection or I'm looking for them to make a persuasive argument about what they've read or what they've screened. Um, I'll speak to that a little bit. I have, uh, Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> I do infographics in my, one of the reasons I'm attending this is I already do this in, as a final project in one of like my sophomore level classes. And it's uh, actually put them in small groups for the semester. And um, I have them meet multiple times uh, and all of them are assigned like a communication skill that they're, I, I said like you're becoming an expert in this communication skill that you say you need to work on. Um, and so they have assignments throughout the semester where they're asked to like either read a textbook chapter, read a research article, um, engage in some journaling assignments, which are very reflective. And then they talk about it within their group and they take notes throughout the semester about some of like the themes and patterns that they're learning about together. And then as part of their infographic, they're supposed to like integrate these various sources of information, not just like research and textbook and lecture, but also some of their like collective insights, which are highly reflective in nature. And they can like incorporate in that into the infographic as they wish. It can be like little thought bubbles, or it could be how they organize it, or it could be some kind of diagram. It really can be whatever is most authentic to the way that they've organized their understanding of this skill in their mind as a group. So that's a very reflective way. And it really does merge with some of the other more empirically based sources of information. Thank you, Rebecca. That was very helpful. And thank you, Lando, for what you put up there. And I'll be quiet now. <laughs> oh, I think it was a great question, Lisa. And thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, that was 
Thank you for doing that. I was going to say, I think there's ways we can do it. So thank you for um, providing an example of how we already see those happening in some classes. So I appreciate that. Lando, did you have a question, comment? Yeah, just to follow up for the whole group here. Um, what we found is using this is very flexible, but the one thing that does work every single time is being very clear about what you want from the students. And so we teach and live and die by the exemplar. So if we have an, an infographic assignment, we will show them four to five that we want it to look like. like. Get in the wheelhouse of that because maybe they've never done them before. So there's an anxiety about the infographic as a whole. And when you show them, this is exactly what I'm looking for. These four samples get into that zone. The students really get excited and engaged in that way by the clarity that that provides. And then you have some very, very explicit instructions about uh, what you're looking for. So if it does need to have a key quote somewhere on the infographic, then make sure you put that on your, your rubric. So um, that, that clarity has been really great for us. That's the undergrad, grad level, no matter what. So uh, really, no matter the assignment, provide that exemplar and say, when in doubt, do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, in, in the examples that I showed y'all, there were examples of infographs in there. I think it's really important to provide students with that opportunity to, to know how to go and look, either ones that you have created, ones that students have uh, given you permission to share from past work, um, or uh, things that you just went out and Googled and found it. Uh, sometimes I think it is important, and I, I see your question, Andrea, about the them recreating one that you already did. Um, sometimes it's okay to add that extra little statement that says it can't look just like mine, um, that they need to create, go out and find their own template and it can't match yours. And that gives that opportunity for them to have to go out and, and really do a little bit more uh, creation and development on their own. But I think showing them some of those examples and really providing uh, resources for them to go look at helps a lot with that anxiety. Once somebody has created one or two, uh, they have a much better idea of where they're going and what they're looking for and how to do it. Uh, it's just whether or not you get a student when it's their first one uh, and being prepared that you may have students that are everywhere from this is the first one they've ever done or students that yeah, this is what they do. Like they do them all the time. It's part of their their job or it's what they do as a as a hobby um, that this is just something that speaks to them so that goes kind of into your understanding of how you're going to assess them as well so that's just something to think about is the student's level of expertise on that too i'll just do one more quick follow-up based on some of the comments also the the check-in on the infographic has been really important so we'll actually have them uh, submit a prototype or actually several different prototypes and we'll meet with them and say, oh, this really is working. Oh, wait a minute. Look at that section on the second one you did. Let's move that over to the middle of the, of the first prototype. And so what you find is you end up kind of really getting to coach them and, and co-create them to something that you're really proud of by the end. A quick example is we had a student who wanted to present on uh, religion or the lack of certain religions in K-12 schools. And so she made this uh, infographic where she wanted to have all the major world religion uh, symbols uh, embedded into it. And through enough tinkering and together, um, she decided to not spread them out across the infographic. But we actually, her argument was that the K-12 schools are prioritizing Christianity. So she actually laid the world religion symbols as a cross, built it out of a cross. And we were like, oh my gosh, that's powerful. And so that's never been seen before in an infographic from what we could find. And that took about five or six drafts for her to get that big idea. So we really enjoyed that tinkering process with the students. Thank you. That's a great option. I hope that that student lets you share it because that's a, that sounds kind of cool. I do. I do have it. Yes. Good. <laughs> uh, does anybody else have any other questions um, about infographs or comments or needs once otherwise? I'm going to stop recording. Yay.